All right, hello everyone. This is Max Matola with another episode of What's New in Chess. Since yesterday's episode was kind of short and I didn't get in all the um, content I wanted necessarily, also there were some big updates today, I thought, you know what, why not continue the show with part two today. It's October 10th and this is What's New in Chess. Um, so we're going to kick off the show how we always do with the front page. Um, not sure why that's not. Alright, sorry about this. For some reason the front page doesn't want to show up. So let's... Try Um, this is weird. Okay, I don't... For some reason, no window captures are working. So, I'm gonna... All right, let me just try something real quick. Sorry about this. Okay, there we go. Gonna have to make that a lot smaller. Um, yeah, sorry for the delay and everything. All right, so let's bring that up right next to me. Okay, so here we have the front page, and I know um, I did this show just yesterday evening, not, you know, less than um, a around, like, 14, 15 hours ago, but the chess world is so busy that since then there's actually been some very interesting news. So first of all, the pairings are out in the Isle of Man. And they did a little preview. Um, I believe they were out yesterday when I did my show, but I didn't really give that a real look through. And last night I was looking at the pairings and thinking about, well, what pairings are going to make out for big upsets. So in this introduction here, they're talking about how important this tournament is. It was kind of a traditional British tournament that turned into, you know, a qualifier for the biggest closed tournament in the world, featuring the world champion and the world championship challenger, among other players. So obviously, um, the Isle of Man was a huge success for all those that were part of it from the start. Um, Arkady Dvorkovic, the FIDE president, spoke at the opening ceremony. But what I kind of wanted to get to here was the pairings. Um, since the tournament is so strong, and most of the players participating qualified by rating, so the 100 highest rated players in the world got qualification spots. Some of them did decline, so, you know, maybe the 115th highest rated player also got a spot, but obviously it's a very high level tournament. Um, and you can see, obviously for these guys, it's going to be tough out of the opening gates. I mean, Carlson's playing Yuri Kuzubov a very strong Ukrainian player who, at his peak, I know he was, for a fact, he was definitely rated much higher than this, maybe like 2680, 2690, uh, just a couple of years ago. And then Caruana is playing a Chinese grandmaster that I actually had never heard of, called, named Zhang, Zhang Zhang, if 
I, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and often Chinese players are kind of underrated because in China it's hard, you know, for a lot of players to play in the kind of tournament circuit. I think that the Europe and the United States have such stable kind of circuits that make it so easy for even, you know, players with little resources to um, play in the best events they can play in. Because in Europe, you know, every hotel, like every small city, there's going to be some like big open tournament. Um, even with grandmasters playing. And um, in the United States, there are a ton of... Um, well, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. There's a big open circuit while the tournaments work very differently, like different time controls, different situations. Um, the U.S. also really values big tournaments, and a lot of the top players in the U.S. had played in a lot of Opens before they reached kind of their ultimate fame. So, um, yeah, so a lot of Chinese players that aren't as strong don't get those kinds of opportunities. So there's a good chance that this... Zhang guy is very underrated and will give Fabiano a fight. I know that the Chinese have actually scored pretty well against Caruana. Um, maybe partly because of that, because uh, Ding Li Ren beat Caruana in their past two games. I'm remembering Ho Yi Fan doing really well against Caruana. I think she beat him once and almost beat him in another game. Um, and in the pro chess league, he kind of got himself in a bit of trouble in some of his games against Chinese players, um, in his match against the Chengdu Pandas. So, yeah. All right, moving on down is So versus Moisinko. Moisinko, another strong player that I'm kind of surprised to see this low rated. Um... Moisinko has been in the world's top for a while. Well, I mean, by the world's top, I mean, like, the top 100, 150, I guess you could say. Um, and, you know, he's had his fair share of ups and downs, but I think he could definitely hold so to a draw. I mean, for the very top seeds, I don't think any of them are going to lose. Now, I think someone, some of them could be nicked for a half a point, let's say. But I don't think any of them are going to lose. Um, so Nair, who took Geary all the way to Armageddon in the World Cup that just happened, um, he's going to be playing against Anand. And I looked at their head-to-head -head score, and actually Nair has a 1-0 score against Anand. Although that win was in a Blitz game at the previous World Blitz Championship. Um, but still, that means that Nair is going to be a tough opponent. And I probably, I would say I expect a draw in this game. I don't think Anand is going to lose in, you know, a classical game. Honestly, him losing in a classical game to anyone is very rare. He's very solid, very strong. Um... And, oops, yeah, he's very solid, he's very strong, um, and very well prepared. That's kind of his trademark in some ways. Okay, so then moving on to Yu Young Yi versus Mareko. Um, this pairing, they hadn't played any games, so it's kind of tough to judge, but two strong players, definitely going to be a fight. Abasov versus Karyakin, another player who did well in the World Cup. Um, so we'll see what happens. But I don't think Karyakin's going to lose. Grishek against Jumabayev. 
Uh, Grishik actually has a very good score against Jumabayev. I didn't expect that they had played any games. So let's kind of skip down the list here since there are 20 pairings after all. And I don't want to look at all of them. So the two very top ones that I f thought were the most interesting, maybe the most gave the b best chances of an upset would be Bachman versus Watch Tazek and Parla Gross versus Nakamura. Um, so I think that the two things that could provide for an upset, I mean, kind of obvious, either the higher rated players playing badly or the lower rated players playing well. But I feel like when the lower rated players playing well, that doesn't really necessarily make for an upset. Usually that still doesn't cause an upset in the end, um, because even when they're playing really well, they're maybe only at best playing on like about the level or a little under the level of the higher rated player. Whereas when the higher rated player is playing badly, I mean, we've seen like anything can happen. Nakamura got knocked out by Nisipianyu. And um, Watch Tazek got knocked out by Johan Sebastian Christensen in the World Cup. Now, both of those players are much lower rated, so that goes to show that these guys are kind of on tilt um, and they can lose to anyone. So, Bachman being a very sharp player, I believe he's the number one player in Paraguay, although I would have to check that stat, um, because this is the Paraguay flag, right? Yeah, it looks like it. Um, and uh, Nakamura playing Parlagras. Parlagras, another strong uh, Romanian player. And, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying I think they're going to lose, but those se games seem to uh, give the best chances for an upset. So, um, then we have... Alright, what other pairings was I interested in highlighting? Okay, maybe... Well, Vidit versus Sethiramen is an interesting one. I think Sethiramen is a very strong player. I didn't realize that he was down to 2620. I thought he was still around 2660. Or so, but I guess he really dropped a lot of rating. Um, and so he's playing Vidit, and these two are countrymen. I looked at their game history, and they even played a couple games when they were like 14, 15 years old um, in youth tournaments. But Vidit is probably not very beatable, not very unbeatable for Sephiramen since they kind of know each other so well. I mean, you'd imagine being strong players about the same age from the same country, you know, they'd end up getting to know each other pretty well. And while Vidit has been more successful in the end, uh, Sephiramen's also a very strong player, of course capable of upsets. Um, Rachmanov and Matlakov is another interesting one. Again, two players, you know, in the same age range that uh, had played each other quite a few times. And Rachmanov's actually won a couple of their games. Um, the most recent game which they played, I think it was like a blitz game, uh, Rachmanov won. Now, I don't think Matt Lockoff's going to lose, but he's kind of a shaky player. I mean, he sometimes does have, like, streaks one way or the other. So Rachmanov definitely could win. Laquang versus Von Forest, when I was looking at it earlier, I thought this is probably my top pick for an upset because Laquang is a shaky player. Um, you know, he'll always go for a fight. Von Forest is a young, rising player. In fact, 
I'm surprised they haven't played before because they both play in like a lot of the summer classics at St. Louis. And when I think about the summer chess classics, I mean, Laquan has plenty of decisive results. It definitely wouldn't be the first time he's lost to a player, you know, in the 2600 range. So I wouldn't be completely surprised. All right, so this was our first article. Um, kind of a deep dive into the Isle of Man, which, by the way, is starting in about an hour. Um, but the second article, which we'll go into later as part of the next column, if you remember yesterday I was talking about the Pro Chess League and how there would be a big update. I talked about who all the teams were. So now they um, released the next part of this update. So now it's okay for me to say everything. So basically what this update entails is that there's um, not going to be a rating cap anymore, but teams can only have at most five 2700s. However, that means in a given week, they could have four 2700s playing in their lineup, which would be an insanely killer lineup uh, Nothing like we've ever seen before, where teams can maybe have two 2700s from time to time. Um, also, another update is that the players from all over the United States count as local players for the four or five USA teams participating. Um, and also teams can have two free agents in their lineup without incurring a penalty. So those are kind of the smaller updates. Really, the first few ones I talked about were the big ones. So as you can see, the season is starting on January 6th. Um, increased prize fund, rating caps eliminated, league size retracted to 24 teams. I talked about that yesterday relegation eliminated. Yeah, I didn't really mention that. They kind of wanted the Pro Chess League to become an elite league that continues to happen, sort of like an online, say, Bundesliga, um, where teams field a different lineup each week, um, and it's kind of friendly play. Um, so they're, they thought that relegation would kind of be in the way and they just want to keep this league going on and on between friendly teams sort of um so you may be wondering well then how are any new teams going to get into the league well i think we expect for them to re-expand at some point in the future this is kind of only a temporary thing but uh, the new Pro Chess League is definitely very different than the old one. I personally kind of miss the old one. I don't think this was necessarily the right decision. They lost a lot of their fan base. Um, because, let's face it, uh, teams like Minnesota brought in a lot of fans. And now all those fans are kind of gone. And, you know, a lot of the stronger teams are now gone or probably won't do as well because how are they going to recruit 2700s i mean some of these new teams why should we expect them to be able to recruit so many 2700s i mean st louis is like the rich team now they're like the yankees of the pro chess league because they're they can just like buy out everyone and crush everyone um so I mean, if they already w did so well in the old format, you can only imagine what it'll be like when they have, like, Caruana, So, Dominguez, and Zhang in one lineup. Um, so here you can see the list of teams. They kind of changed it so each team is representing their country, except for the four American teams. They decided to have four American teams, um, since, you know, the U.S. is such a big, um, 
contrary for chess, and it would be a huge step down to go from having, well, last season they must have had around, like, 14, 13 um, American teams to having just one. Uh, still a big step down. I mean, they lost, like, Webster and Minnesota and Dallas and all these teams that we remember so well. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you can see Eric Hansen flashing the suit and bow tie for the Montreal chess bras turned Canada chess bras. Okay, so I think that's enough for our front page news for today, um, but definitely a lot of intrigue there. And now we're going to be getting into a fun um, column that I did yesterday. I was talking about how I kind of wasn't really planning to do this, um, but I also decided to do it today kind of for continuity and also, it's a very special person in the chess community's birthday. Um, and while probably a lot of you don't know this, I thought it would be appropriate to have a tribute for this person. Um, the special person of the day is the one and only Oh, never mind. The image won't show up. Well, that was kind of anticlimactic. I really don't know what's going on today. First, the um, first the board, and now first the window capture. Now this, but okay, I have to open it again. But here it is, the one, the only Daniel Ranch that as he nicknamed the job, the chief chess officer of chess.com. And I think, you know, all of us who stream and all of us who are, uh, you know, are active in the chess community know that Daniel Ranch does quite a job for chess.com and he has worked at chess.com since the very start for right now that would be about 10 years um, that he's worked for chess.com and so yeah uh, he's been a key part of their growing he's done a lot of work in streaming and preparing shows and events and filming videos and doing commentary. He does a lot of the stuff himself, um, going all the way back to the start. He participated in the first ever death match, um, did a lot of the instructive videos for chess.com. So Danny is always working hard behind the scenes, even if that doesn't, even if that sometimes means that he can't um, do as many shows on chess TV as we would want him to. Um, so Danny also, some of you don't know that he was actually a very, very strong junior player himself, one of the top players in the country, um, until he had a medical condition that forced him to step away from the game for two years. And you can only imagine that someone so addicted to chess must really struggle not being able to play and, you know, sitting back and watching himself being, you know, watching different players cross him and, you know, that kind of hopelessness of not being able to do anything about so many players, um, jumping ahead of you. And also, uh, I remember Danny said this on stream once, I'm not sure exactly when this happened, but he did say that he was number three in the United States at one point, um, behind Nakamura and Komsky. I assume that was when he was in his youth, because at this point, um, players in their youth can be 
at the top of their countries. We see, like, Ali Reza Farooza is 16, and he's the number one Iranian player in the world. Um, not to mention the number one... Um, well, you know, one of the top juniors and certainly one of the top, certainly the top player for his age group since juniors is really a term for all players under 21. Um, but back to Danny Wrench, he's done so many great things for the chess community. Can't thank him enough. Um, and so I wanted to say happy birthday to Danny um, and he'll actually be live soon. He's going to be calling into the uh, Isle of Man coverage, doing some um, some commentary for that tournament. Although he will not be on site. Um, and yeah, that's just a little tribute to our player of the day. All right. Let me just check the chat real quick. By the way, if you're watching, make sure to say hi. Give me any questions or ideas you have for the stream. A lot of people do that. Um, you know, recommend ideas, video ideas, and stuff. So that would be amazing um, if you're willing to do that. Um, all right, and now another portion of the show that's pretty laid back and fun. So we're going to be doing daily slash vote chess. So again, there is kind of only one game to to talk about, unfortunately, so I guess I'm going to go pretty deep into it. Um, it was a vote chess game. Um, against Old Dirty Bispo. So, um, so here I am playing with the black pieces. I am up a piece and a pawn, but it looks like they're kind of crashing through here. So, my last move was knight b7 with the plan of playing knight d6 to try to trade. Um, so, obviously, if they trade, I'm pretty happy here. I can you know, probably just defend the pawn, and although, eh, but then I get this one. And also, if they take here, now I can trade. Obviously, trading is what I want since I'm up a piece here. Um, so, yeah. Maybe this game got a little messier than I would have wanted, but I think that's okay. Um, and if they back out of the trade, let's say knight c3, the most natural looking move. Well, now I have a good outpost on either f5 or e4, depending on which one I want to go to. Um, I think f5 makes more sense, but yeah, they both look pretty good. So, um, so that seems like a pretty self-explanatory move. I could also play rook g1 and you know, prophylaxis for after they take the pawn. But I think knight d6 makes the most sense. It's also a tempo after all, so. Um, I realize I said, you know, maybe I'll do a deep dive into the game since I only have one. That wasn't so much of a deep dive, but you kind of get my thought process on these things. So, uh, since, you know, since I don't have any other games to talk about, really, might as well just move on now. Um, so, let's see.
All right, so now for the Pro Chess League update. And I did a lot of talk about the Pro Chess League yesterday, but now that I can release more information, there's, you know, more to talk about, and we can go deep into what I think this new update means for the league. Um... Uh oh. Shoot. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe the software glitched out because I'm not able to bring up things that I wanna show on screen. Um but that's okay, we can just talk about it kind of openly now. So I kinda shared my opinion a little earlier that I don't think this is the best update. Especially since a lot of the teams that are playing don't even have a single local 2700. So how will they get five? And even if they do, they'll have to be mostly free agents. Or, I mean, all free agents. So they can only have two play at a time, whereas St. Louis could have four 2700s playing at the same time easily. So I just feel like, you know, it favors whatever team has the most money. I know they're looking for more, like, sponsorships um, this season and for more teams to be money-based, um, making it more like a traditional eSports league. Um, but I kind of liked the previous Pro Chess League, which was kind of more local and you're rooting for your own teams, kind of like Major League Baseball. Um, and it was kind of a combination of America and the world, and I feel like it worked very well because there was kind of that like local thing with, you know, America, and then you got the intrigue of then having a ton of teams abroad um, and all of them getting to play. Um, it just felt very compact and, you know, both exciting and um, interesting and um, just a good format. And now they're narrowing it down to three divisions. And by far, most of the teams are European now. Even teams from countries like Israel and Germany and Hungary, um, and Italy that have no 2700s. Um, also, a lot of these teams were seeded straight in from the qualifier to the league without having to qualify. And, you know, obviously they want the play level to be very elite. But some of these teams, like the Sweden Wasabis and the Turkey Knights, failed to qualify last season. So how, could, how should they be seeded directly in if they couldn't even qualify last time? Um, and now, you know, they want the league to be even more elite. So a team that failed to qualify for the kind of less elite league, how should they be seated directly into the more elite league? Um, so I think a lot of these teams are kind of kind of going to struggle in this new, newly formatted league. Um, and also kind of struggle getting the money and sponsorships to keep going. Um, so far, there hasn't really been any major uh, information from the team captains on this matter um, and what, how they are going, planning to deal with this change. Although I know you, Ludwig Hammer, who was a popular Chess.com streamer, he is now streaming for Chess24. So the future of the Norway Gnomes, his team, is kind of up in the air. I know he's going to be hiring some people to help out with the team and um, to 
continue the legend of the gnomes. But it'll definitely be tough for the gnomes because they only have one 2700 Magnus Carlsen. He is very unlikely to play um, considering that he hasn't played in chess.com in a while. I think he's also contracted to chess24, but I'm not sure exactly what the details are of that. Um, okay, so that's it for our PCL update for now. The qualifier dates and everything are still up in the air, but make sure to get out there and root for the Washington Wasps. All right, and now on to the Speeches Championship update. So, um, the yesterday I was doing my Speeches Championship fantasy, um, and so I'm going to continue to do that today since I have some more time to think about that. All right, so let's bring up window capture. Um, all right, so let's go to clubs. And you can do this yourself, so make sure to keep an eye on what I'm doing here. So go to clubs, SEC Prediction Nerds. If you aren't already in the SEC Prediction Nerds club, you can go to clubs. Um, just click here, search SEC Prediction Nerds. Um, this should come up. Click on it. And so now go to the SEC Round 2 Prediction Form. Uh, make sure to fill out your bracket before Round 2 starts. There still haven't been any dates announced for matches, so we don't really know uh, when it's going to start, but keep an eye out for information. Okay. Um... this five and my prediction for this match if I remember correctly was 17 to 12. All right so let's move on to Nepomniachtchi versus Ding. This is a much tougher match to predict um, since this is Ding's debut um, in the speeches championship. He this is the first time first year he's playing um, and his He's only played one match against Sam Shanklin, and Shanklin, while he's a strong player, he's definitely not quite on the level of, um, of Nepomniachtchi. So it's hard to know what to expect, but I looked at the, the, these two players' head-to-head -head score, and Nepomniachtchi has an amazing score against Sting. I think it's something like 8-1. to one. Um, of course, including Rapid and Blitz, because I don't think they would have played that many games in Classical. Although, maybe. Who knows? Um, but, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was, like, maybe 9-2 to two or something like that. Um, but, yeah, we d definitely have a lot of matches to refer to for Napomniachi. Um, his match against Danielian doesn't feel comparable though. So let's see. Um, 2018 event and 2017 event. Um, so we lost by six points to Grisha last time. In the time before that, he let's wait for this to load. Okay, here. So the time before that, he beat Aronian by two points, but then lost by ten to Karyakin. So all right, he's lost to his fellow Russians. It seems like. Yeah, I mean it's tough to know what the score line will be. But I think I had Napomniachi winning this one, um, and 
I mean, I think Ding will put up a fight. He did very well in Bullet against Shanklin, so that'll be interesting to see. But I, if I re recall correctly, Nepomniachtchi is also very good at Bullet, so... Um, hmm... I guess it would make sense for it to be kind of similar to the Aronian match, but maybe a slightly wider scoreline. I mean, before I predict the actual score, why don't we do something we did previously, which is find these players' average amount of games played. Oops. Um, so let's bring up an average calculator. So in Ding's first match, he played 31 games. 31, um, and then, well, in Napomniachi's first match, we should know he played 29 games, um, and then in his previous match, he also played 29 games, 28 and 30. Okay, let's calculate that. So 29.4, so we'll say 29 games. Um, not sure, maybe a three point margin, something like that. This is a tough one to predict. Um, maybe Napomniachi runs away with it and bullet. I think it's definitely possible. Um, I want to go with a wider score line. Hmm, that's a tough one. All right, I'll go with the same score as Nakamura. Judah, how about 17 to 12? I'll look over it later and change it. Oops, so 17, Mepo, and 12, Ding. Okay. Vashe Lagrav, so... So I had Vashe Lagrav winning this one, but let's take a look at, um, first of all, the players, the, the amount of games they usually play. All right, so 31 in this one. Um, and So's first round match against um, Mamdiarov was 18 to 12, if I remember correctly. So that would be 30 games. Um, last year, so had 28, 28, 27, oops, all right, so, um, 28, 27, 29, and 28. And then Vashi Lagrav played 31 and 35. So obviously these guys are both veterans. They've played a ton of matches, which makes this job a little harder since I have to go through so many matches. All right, so 30. And I think this match was probably the record for the most games played because they played 37. So these guys will probably have a high amount of games based on their average seeming pretty high. 31 and 29. 30 and a half. All right, I'm gonna round that up, I guess. Um, I guess, so their matches this year are maybe a bit of recency bias or 30 and 31 games. Okay, that doesn't really help me. Um, all right, all right, I'll just go with 31 then. So...
And let's look for comparable matches. I mean, obviously it's going to be close. So when has Vashi Lagrav won a close match? Like a real fight. <laughs> it looks like he's never really won a close match. That's a thing. Um, hmm. All right, well, So has lost a close match against Nakamura. I mean, I think this one will be... Vashi Lagrov will maintain a pretty steady lead and hold on to it. I just feel like he's been playing pretty well in Rapid and Blitz lately, and he um, seems like the person who's gotten a lot of practice and, and, and you know, stuff like that. So, um... I'll say a three-point margin, I guess. So that would be 17, oops, 14, 17. All right, Aronian versus Artemyev. That's a tough one. So let's first calculate the average. So Artemyev's only played one match against Grishuk, which was 16 to 9, so that would be 27 games. Um, Aronian's first match against Feruzja was 28 games. And then all of Aronian's previous matches. So his match against Fabi was 27, 29 against Geary. Um, 29 against Naka. Twenty-eight against Nepo. All right, twenty-eight exactly. Yeah, so Aronian's played a lot of tough matches, um, and he's often come through. Um, I originally had Aronian winning this match, although Artemia's convincing performance. And the last match might cause me to change that. But I'm going to stick by my original pick um, and say Aronian wins very narrowly. Um, I'll say... Um, yeah, I mean, maybe he holds off a comeback and bullet. That would probably be what would most likely happen. So, similar to his match against Sally Russo. So, I'll say a two point margin, nice and clean, 15, 13. Um, all right, I think these are all pretty believable scores. And since, you know, I don't have the most time in the world, I'm going to do this. And then kind of dive into another factor of this whole process, which is the um, responses. And if you watch my last show, you know that I said, you know, I'm kind of part of this official process. So basically, these predictions, um, we calculate the average of everyone's predictions, and they go on the live show. Um, like, you know, the official live show. And so, so first let's look at the sheet, and then we'll calculate the average score for each match. Still loading. Wow, it's being very slow at the moment. In the meantime, let's check the chat, I suppose. Um, hi, Umesh, if you're still watching. Oh, Israel has Gelfon. Gelfon's not over 2,700, though.
sorry that I didn't see your comment earlier. I would have um, replied more quickly, but yeah, I'm not sure why it's taking so long to load. Um. All right, let's reload the page. That's kind of the classic tech fix. Before people knew how to actually do things with computers, just reload the page. Okay, uh, yeah, it looks like this isn't loading. Let me go to Google Sheets, actually. NSPCL predictions, that's not what I want. Oh man, that's taking forever to load. Well, maybe I'll have to do this another time. Um, my plan for the end of the show was to talk about um, what your watch list should be.